October 7th, 2023, we know was the deadliest day for our people since the Holocaust. Many of us have heard the stories of survival and death. Many of us have gone to Israel since. Many of us have gone to the Nova Festival exhibit that was here in LA. And so I don't need to go into the details or the stories because many of us have heard the stories and even whatever it is that you've heard or experienced since then, we all know that our people suffered a great tragedy that day and the ensuing war has been horrific since. So a question arises from October 7th and it's not the first time this question comes up. The same question has arisen from the Holocaust and on a personal level, We've all experienced personal crises in our lives, big and small, so the question has come up on a personal level, and here's the question. How could God let this happen? So there's a few theories to explain the problem of evil in God's world. So I want to start briefly with one theory, and I think it best one of the best ways to start it off is with um, Alex Edelman, the comedian, his favorite joke. And here it is. A man dies and goes to heaven, and he meets God. And this man says to God, God, can I tell you a joke? God says, sure. And so the man proceeds to tell God a Holocaust joke. So God says to the man after the joke, you know, I really don't find that funny. And the man says to God, well, I guess you had to be there. So that's uh, one understanding of how to make sense of the problem of evil is that God is absent. This idea of God being absent has come up a lot. Um, we've talked a lot about this book of poetry that's been collected by Rachel Korazim, among others, called Shiva or Shiva, Poems of October 7th. And in it, there's a lot of these I de these poems that have this question of where was God. So for example, a poem inspired by Mourner's Kaddish by Asaf Gur says this, Yitkadal v'yitkada shemei raba, and no one came. Many thousands called to God on Shabbat morning, crying God's name out loud, tearfully begging God just to come. But God has ceased from all God's work. No God arrived. So this is one theory but for me, the problem with this theory is that there is no God in this scenario, or at least there's no God who is present in our lives if this is the theory that we, we embrace. So I want to try other theories that do have a God present in our lives. So the theory that is perhaps the most common answer, the most conventional theology that many of us grew up with, this idea of theology, is the theology of reward and punishment. If we're good, if we do good behavior, if we follow God's laws, we get rewarded by God. And if we do bad behavior, if we disobey God's commandments, we get punished by God. This is all over the Torah. It's really explicit in Deuteronomy. The second paragraph of the Shema that we read comes from Deuteronomy, and it literally says, if you obey God's commandments, you will be rewarded. If you disobey God's commandments, you will be punished. This concept of God's reward and punishment is found all over rabbinic literature as well as in the Tanakh, it's in Talmud, it's in Midrash, and it does serve us in a couple of ways. The reason it's so common is it upholds this idea that God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful in this understanding of the problem of evil in God's world. What it does with evil is it softens the concept of evil. It makes evil not actually really evil, because if we deserve what we get, even if the punishment can be sometimes uncomfortable or unpleasant to experience, and sometimes it can be downright traumatic to experience, but if we deserve it, it's not actually evil. What it is, is God dealing out justice. This is God's justice, if it's reward and punishment. So it's not, it's not really evil, is it? But there's a problem. There's a couple of problems with understanding this problem of evil as reward and punishment. One of the major problems is that God becomes our punisher. 
And that's a problem because our tradition tells us that we're supposed to be having a loving relationship with God. How can we have a loving relationship with a God who is our punisher? And here's the other major problem with this theology or theodicy, understanding of the problem of evil in God's world, is that, as we all know, bad things happen to good people. So we have to give this theory up because it doesn't work for us. First of all, if we want to have this loving relationship with God, it's really hard to love a punishing God. But especially, how can we love a God who's punishing, punish, seems to be punishing, good people? It doesn't make sense. So we have to move past this theory of evil by evil being explained away with this reward and punishment. So this idea that we deserve what we get, as comedian Jack Benny once said, I don't deserve this award, but I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either. So like Jack Benny, we need to let go of the notion that we are deserving of the things that happen to us in our lives because God is rewarding us for being good or God is punishing us for being bad. So we have to find another solution, another answer, because that answer doesn't, it doesn't satisfy me and I have a feeling it's, it's a difficult answer for many in this room is, is my feeling. So let's try and come up with other answers. So that's what our conversation is gonna be trying to come up with other answers to this question. I don't think there's ever been a human being alive who at some point or another didn't say, why me? Because the human condition is vulnerable. I try to explain this to children sometimes. When God created us, God made a very interesting decision to put us into bodies. Now, ordinarily, bodies have lots of advantages. Taking a warm, taking a cool swim on a warm day, mint chocolate chip ice cream, I'm sorry, having a hug from a child. But bodies have one distinct disadvantage. Bodies are made out of stuff, and all stuff breaks. That's the second law of thermodynamics of the great rabbinic sage, Rab Isaac Newton. All stuff breaks. And then we have a paradox. Because the human soul is so precious and so unique. Each one of us is a precious, unique addition to the world. And yet, we're carried around in the world in a vessel which is so vulnerable, which is so risky, which is so uh, prone to accidents and exigencies and aging. And so the question is, how do you live and find meaning in a world where, as the rabbi said, bad stuff happens to good people all the time? How do you put together a world that allows you to walk and have a sense of tomorrow? How do you have faith in that world and confidence in that world? There have been many in human history who simply gave up and sat down and said, there's no meaning to any of this, and so I'm not going to try, and lived a life of pure hedonism. If you ever want to see that, just turn on pretty much any channel on television. It's right there. But our tradition, as so in many other religious traditions, tried to say there has to be more to human life. And therefore, I tried to find some way of understanding this, some way of understanding how I find meaning in a world that sometimes hurts. How do I get through those moments of hurt? Where do I find resilience and courage to get forward after a tragedy, after something this terrible happened? October 7th is horrendous catastrophe that has come upon the Jewish people, the Israel, Israelis and American Jews and Jews about the world. The great miracle is October 8th, that Israel didn't just lie down and die, but decided to rise up and assert itself, assert its right to defense, but more than that, its right to life, its right to be alive. And how do you, how do you construct a conceptual world that allows one to find that resilience how does one construct a, res a world that allows you to have faith in tomorrow? Let me put it more bluntly. How do you find faith in the world that allows you to have children? How do you find faith in the world that allows you to have children? Because if we believe that the world was simply random and that terrible things happen all the time, well, nobody would want to have kids. First of all, it would be sadistic to bring children into such a world. And second of all, it would be... It, it, it would 
it, it would not be a world that, that we could even trust enough to bring a child into. So first of all, I want to tell you that anyone who here has kids or loves kids is already a believer, whether you know it or not. Because it bespeaks a sense of confidence, a sense of faith, a sense of, um, a sense of wholeness to existence. The first thing is what the rabbi talked about. We were all little kids once. And when we were little, we did something wrong. And our parents punished us, at least my parents did. And so we sometimes project that into the world, that, that, that experience of being six or seven or eight years old. And we imagine that God is a punishing parent, as the rabbi said. And that I get rewarded for the good things I do and punished for the bad things I do. And that is probably the most conventional theology in the world. You'll even find it in the prayer book. It's a very, very conventional theology. The difficulty, of course, with that theology is that it just doesn't hold up in our empirical experience. And even the Bible knew this. Because even in the Bible, there's a huge book called Job, which questions this theology. In the Talmud, they had a better way of putting it. The Talmud said, suppose a fellow steals a bag of seeds from his neighbor and plants the seeds. If God were really judging the world, it would never rain on that man's field, and those seeds would never grow. But the rain comes, and the seeds grow. And therefore, olam kemin hago noheg, said the rabbis. The world pursues its own natural course. And not everything is a decision of God. They go one more step further. This one's a little R-rated. Suppose a man goes and has relations with his neighbor with his neighbor's wife. There should not be a baby from that relationship, because after all, it was, it was sinful. But cells don't know good and evil. Olam kemin hago noheg, the world pursues a natural course. So if there is no reward and punishment given to us by nature, then in what way does God intervene in this world? And that's the question that the rabbis asked us to consider, and it's a critical question. Let me propose one way of thinking about it, and then I know the rabbi has a different way. So this year, we will commemorate the 10th yard site of my teacher, Rabbi Harold Shulwas. And in April, his 100th birthday, there's a little booklet of his teachings that we put on, the, on a table in the lobby. I hope you'll take one of them home. This was the problem, this problem of bad things and suffering going on in the world. This was the problem that was central to Rabbi Shulwitz for three principal reasons. First, because he grew up, he was 17 years old when the Holocaust happened. And the Holocaust weighed on him as a young scholar. He couldn't accept the theologies that were offered to him in seminary because he knew that radical evil proved them all to be untrue. And the second thing was his work as a rabbi. He used to tell us all the time that when he first began his career as a rabbi, it was in Oakland, California in 1952, and the very summer that he arrived in the community, a young person in the community died in a traffic accident. And he had to go to the cemetery and do a service, and I will tell you as a rabbi, that is the most brutal thing we, we have to do. And he couldn't say the words of the tradition. You know that it's traditional that when someone dies, you say, Baruch Dayan Emet, blessed is the true judge. But the rabbi said, in what way is this judgment? This was a sweet, wonderful, innocent child who was killed in the most random, silly, horrible way. And so he needed to find a new way to understand this very problem. And then the third thing happened, he had his own experiences. One of his children was born with a very serious birth defect that she suffered through through all of her childhood. And he used to tell me, Rabbi Shulweis told me about the nights he spent sleeping in the hospital next to her, on a cot next to his daughter in, a, in an NICU as they struggled to save this young woman's life. She's okay. She's now a mother herself. She's done very well. But this experience of personal suffering and communal suffering and universal suffering taught him that the traditional ways of understanding that was just nothing he could accept. 
So he looked for another way. And I'll tell you how he found it. There's a marvelous Hasidic story from a wonderful rabbi, a very tough rabbi. We think of Hasidic rabbis as very sweet guys who attack you with tefillin in the mall. But th- 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 there was one named Rabbi Nachum Mendel of Kotsk, who was a very, very tough guy, insisted on honesty. And the story is that a young man once came to Rabbi Menachem Mendel, the Kotzker, and, they, and he said to him, Rebbe, I've lost my faith in God. I've lost my faith in God. And the Rebbe looks at him and said, why? And he said, Rebbe, look at the world. There's so much in the world that is broken, so much suffering, so much pain, so much that is wrong. How can I believe in a God of justice in a world such as this? And the boy thought that the Rebbe would get angry at him, or that he would give him some facile teaching, some superficial truth. Instead, the Rebbe looked deep into the kid's eyes and he said, do you care? Why do you care? And the young man was taken aback and he said, of course I care. I have to care. I mean, there's so much in the world. There's so many who cry out in pain. There's so many who are in difficulty. There's so many who are in need. Of course I have to care. And the Rebbe looked deeper into his eyes and says, you really care? And the young man said, of course I have to care. One has to care when one sees this in the world. It calls to you. It touches my heart. Of course I have to care. And the Rebbe did it one more time. He looked even deeper into the kid's soul. And he said, but why do you care? And the young man just broke into tears. Just began to cry. And he said, I have to care. There's no other way but to care. Someone needs to care. And the Rebbe held his hands and said to him, young man, if you care that much, then God exists. If you care that much, then God exists. And for Rabbi Shulweis, that was a way. And for him, the idea was, don't look for God up there. Look for God in here. Torah tells us that we are each created in the image of God. So the most proximate locus for God in this universe is right here in each of us. And you look for God in here. And so evidence of human courage for Rabbi Shulweis was evidence of God's presence in the world. One of his campaigns, if you knew him, and again, if you see the booklets, it's there, is he started being obsessed, I think that's the word, with Christian rescuers of Jews in the Holocaust. We all saw the movie about Oskar Schindler. Turns out there were many Oskar Schindler. Maybe as many as 50,000 Oscar Schindlers, 50,000 Christians and some Muslims who risked their lives and risked their families to rescue Jews in the world. Some of them were very important people. The prince and princess of the country of Bulgaria, where there was a sizable Sephardic Jewish population, ordered the whole community to lie down on the railroad tracks so that the Gestapo's trains could not enter Bulgaria and all the Jews of Bulgaria were saved. You all know the story about Denmark, that 90% of the Jews of Denmark were saved because the people of Denmark decided you're not going to take our neighbors and they smuggled them across the isthmus into Sweden. You don't know the story of Jupp Westerval, who was a Dutch high school teacher who led bicycle caravans from Holland through France, through the Pyrenees into Spain and saved Jews. You don't know the story of Father Benoit in Paris who who sheltered thousands of Jewish kids in convents all over rural France. There are so many of these stories. And Rabbi Shulwai said, the reason I tell those stories is not because I deny the evil of the Nazis but because it's evidence to me that God exists in the hearts of those who do what's right, who have conscience. And so he he offered us one little gloss on our prayer book. He said, whenever you come to a prayer which asks God to do something, here's what I want you to do, he said. I want you to add two words to the end of the bracha. Through me. Through me. So if you say, Baruch Motzi Lechem in Haaretz, I bless God who brings bread to the earth and feeds the hungry, say, 
And blessed is God who brings peace. And blessed is God who brings healing. And blessed is God who loves justice. Amen. So that answer is one way of understanding this idea that works. Here's another dimension of that idea, another way to understand the same idea. And I want to start by sharing one of my favorite pieces of Talmud to show you how I came to this understanding of God. So in this piece of Talmud from Tractate Ta'anit, it says that the people of Israel were at one time or another leaving the land of Israel, and they were nervous that God wasn't going to come with them from the land and accompany them to wherever they were headed. So they said to God, God, come with us and be unto us like the rain. And God said to the people of Israel, you request my presence, comparing me to something that is sometimes desired, but sometimes undesired. So sometimes we really want rain and we're in a drought and there's no rain, but sometimes there's a flood or all these hurricanes that have you know, been coming up lately. So sometimes rain is not what we want. So God says, how about this? I'm gonna come with you, but I'm not gonna be to you like the rain. I'm gonna be to you like a matter that is always desired. I'm gonna be to you like the dew. And then God quotes a verse from Hosea, Hosea, which we actually read in the Haftorah on Shabbat Shuvah this past Shabbat. Israel. I will be as the dew to the people of Israel. I love this idea of God accompanying us as the dew because dew is something stable. We know it's there every morning. And unlike rain, which can flood or drought, dew is this idea of just enoughness. God is with us in this way that's just enough. And this metaphor for dew likens God to something which we always desire. We always desire dew in the morning. And so if God is with us like the dew, then we get to have that loving relationship with God that our tradition really wants us to have. And it also means that when we face the catastrophes of the world, God is with us constantly, with this constancy. It's this philosophy of accompaniment. We know, as Rabbi Feinstein said, that suffering is a part of life. We know that that's part of the world that we live in. And what this does, this idea of God accompanying us like the do, is that it lets us know that we're not alone. And we're not alone in our suffering. And there's another piece of Talmud that backs this up from Tractate Brachot. And it says that God remembers God's children who are suffering among the nations of the world. And when God remembers us suffering, God sheds two giant tears into the great sea. And the sound of the reverberation of the tears entering the sea is heard from one end of the earth to the other. And that, the Talmud says, is what causes an earthquake. So this idea that God is with us in our suffering I find a lot of comfort in that. And I want to share a story from my family. I shared um, in our October 7th ceremony about my very large, 100-strong family in Israel. And so I have, of that family, my dad's youngest sister, my daughter Leah, my aunt, um, she's Haredi. She's ultra-Orthodox. So her and her husband, my uncle, my dod Benyamin, they have nine children. And the oldest of their nine children, his name is Eliyahu. And many, many years ago, not so many, but it feels like in my lifetime, many years ago, um, several years ago, Eliyahu married someone named Shana. And Shana is the sweetest, most amazing person. You can't help but love her. She's one of those people that just lights up a room, just so sweet. And they tried for many years to have children, and it was hard for them, which is always hard and especially hard in a Haredi setting. And finally, Shana got pregnant with twins. And, um, and it, the twins came early, and it was a boy and a girl, and the boy died at birth, and the girl survived in the NICU for three months, and she died after three months. And it was, of course, very hard in my family. My grandmother, my Safda Edi, this is on my dad's side, she 
went and visited in Israel. She visited Shana and Eliyahu when they were with their baby girl in the NICU. And it was really, really difficult in our family. And Shana really was truly grappling with her faith in God, or she might not say it that way. She might see it that she was strong in her faith in God during this difficult time. What she did was she hand wrote out letters to all of her sisters and all of her sister-in-laws and all of her girl cousins and all of Eliyahu's girl cousins, which means I got a letter, my sister Ronit got a letter, my cousin Sarah got a letter, my cousin Yakira, who I shared with at the October 7th ceremony, she got a letter. We all got this handwritten letter because they don't use technology, so it's not like she could just type up an email and send it out to us. Like, she sat and wrote each letter. And in the letter, she wrote this story about a father who had two sons, and oftentimes for lunch, he would make his older son a peanut butter sandwich, and he would not make that for his younger son. He would make something different for his younger son. And the younger son really, really wanted a peanut butter sandwich like his older brother got. So he did everything he could to make his father know that he deserved a peanut butter sandwich. He cleaned his room, and he put away his toys, and he made his bed, and he did everything, everything, everything. And every time he did this, he would say to his dad, now can I have a peanut butter sandwich? And his dad would say, no, you can't. What the little boy didn't know, what he couldn't understand, but that his father understood, was that he was allergic to peanut butter. So this was the story that Shana used to explain that God, in her understanding, knew better than Shana and Eliyahu that there was, for some reason, this mysterious thing, but God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-good, and there's this good reason why this tragedy happened to them. There's this legitimate reason that they couldn't have those babies. I will say, now they have five kids, so, and they, you know, they're going to keep trying for more. And um, so that's, that's her faith, and that's how she understood that. And, you know, my sister and I and some of the other girl cousins, we talked about it, and we said, you know, Shana, is, she has this beautiful faith, and it's not the faith that works for me because, like Rabbi Feinstein and I have said, this understanding of, you know, God knows all, and so that's going to explain away. So, so what happened to her wasn't actually this tragedy. It was just what she deserved. It doesn't make sense. Like we, we said before, many reasons why it doesn't work. And so in my life, I have found that I do not need the understanding of God who's responsible for everything because it just doesn't work for me. So um, I prefer knowing as the Talmud from Ta'anit and God being with us like the dew and the Talmud from Brachot and God being with us in the suffering. I prefer understanding a God that's with us in that way, this God of accompaniment, this God that's with us like the dew, this God that's with us in the suffering, this God who in the case of October 7th and all that has come since cries with us and sits in the tunnel under Gaza with us, a God who accompanies us always and gives us strength and comes with us on our journey just as the dew is with us every morning, God is always with us. Just as the rabbis say there's 70 faces to the Torah, which means there's all kinds of legitimate ways to interpret the Torah, so too are there 70 faces to understanding this question. And so there's this one that I offered with God of accompaniment. There's Rabbi Feinstein and Rabbi Schulweis's, the God within us and what we have to do as humans. And there's also my cousin Eliyahu and Shana's way of looking at it. There's also, whatever way you want to look at this, all of this, this too is Torah. Marachatimatova and Shabbat Shalom. And thank you, Rabbi Feinstein.